please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Several weeks ago, I had a dream. It was a very vivid dream. The dream was on an interstate system with many lanes, and there was a very steep slope, and I was driving rather fast down the steep slope. About halfway down, there were these fixed counters, like you might see in a big city that will check your speed. And if you're going too fast, they'll take a picture of your car and your license plate and send you a ticket. <laughs> At the bottom of the hill in my dream was a building that you had to go into if you thought you were going too fast. So I went into this building, and the chap behind the counter said, well, I can find your picture on the computer screen. We found my car, and he said, oh, yes, you were going too fast. I said, how fast was I going? He said, 27,000 miles per hour. <laughs> I said, that can't be right. I was driving a Honda. <laughs> but in my dream, that's what was happening. And then he said, by the way, you'll have a ticket to pay, $79 and five hours of community service. That's how the dream went. Unless you think I drive too fast in my little super horse. I often take my mother from Aurora to Grand Island on Highway 34, and she often tells me, you're going too slow, speed up. So I don't think I'm going too fast when I'm driving. But perhaps if you had the gift of interpretation of dreams, you might say that I was going too fast in life because I was going too fast in my dream. Perhaps so, an exaggerated dream. As we turn to our Old Testament lesson this morning in Nehemiah, perhaps for God's chosen people, the Israelites, the problem was that they were not going too fast, but too slow. And it took Nehemiah, who had a very comfortable government job, as it were, in the king's palace, as the cupbearer to the king and queen, to pick up the pace. But I'm getting just a little ahead of my story. If you remember from the Old Testament, the zenith of Israel was under King David and King Solomon. King David and Solomon were, were the height of the kingdom of Israel. And then you remember that King Solomon, who built the temple, had a son that turned out to be a very poor king, King Rehoboam. He was like some of the rulers that we've had in our own country and elsewhere in the world. We thought he would make life a little more miserable for the people and raise taxes and conscript more people into the armies of the time, not a voluntary draft system by any means. The people rebelled. Half of Israel went to the northern kingdom. Those were the 10 tribes that went north, and then two tribes remained in Judah, Judah and Benjamin. And this was, of course, the southern kingdom that included Jerusalem. In 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar came with the Babylonians and besieged Jerusalem. Their armies surrounded the whole city. There was no way the people could get in or out. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar with his armies breached the walls. Walls were leveled around Jerusalem, and the gates were burned with fire. Jerusalem was taken, and the temple was destroyed. Now, following King Nebuchadnezzar was a man by the name of Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great was of the great Medo Persian Empire. He conquered the Babylonians. And he became somewhat of a benevolent ruler for the Jews. He allowed these exiled Jews to slowly make their way back to Jerusalem. He called them deportations. A group here, a group there. Not too many at a time to keep them weak, but he allowed them to go back. And in 516 BC, they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Seventy years later, after it was destroyed under Nebuchadnezzar, they rebuilt the temple. So that's a great thing, obviously, for the people to have their temple rebuilt. But then nothing much happened. And now we pick up with the story with Nehemiah. 445 BC, here's Nehemiah the same. Remember, he's cupbearer to the king. The king at that time was Art Xerxes. Interesting name. So what does a cupbearer to the king do? Well, he brings the wine and the food to the king and queen. It's got to be a pretty good job, power, wealth. Position, you have access to the king and queen. Probably the only takeaway from that would be if the food or wine happened to be poisoned, because none of the things wouldn't go so well. But assuming that doesn't happen, the cupbearer has a good job. Interestingly, 
one of the Jews from Jerusalem just happens to be coming through Susa, which is where the palace is located for this king and queen, and he happens to run into Nehemiah. And he says to Nehemiah, do you realize that the walls are still down around Jerusalem and the gates have still been burned with fire? And the response of Nehemiah was to mourn, to weep, to fast, and to pray. He was devastated that his fellow Jewish people were demoralized and discouraged back in Jerusalem. Interesting, almost sounds a little bit like Lent, doesn't it? Remember, Lent starts this year on Ash Wednesday, February the 10th. He's already taken two of the typical Lenten practices to heart, fasting and prayer, and thirdly, and almsgiving. My two-point sermon today, not three points, <laughs> are this. Is this. If you choose to follow God, expect challenges. And number two, if you expect to follow God, expect God to bless you. Nehemiah's going to find this out very quickly. Because the very next time he goes before the king and the queen to bring the food and the wine, the king, who's apparently very insightful, maybe a good man of, of, of understanding the, the moods and conditions of people, he could read people well, he said to Nehemiah, he said, why are you so sad? I mean, Nehemiah had been a pretty happy-go-lucky, you know, joyful kind of person. Not a bad job to have in the king's palace, be a cupbearer to the king and queen. Nehemiah was sad because of the news from Jerusalem. And interesting, in this very moment when Nehemiah is explaining what's wrong. The king said, what would you like me to do for you? Have any of you ever met somebody really important? I mean, pretty important in this world. When I was in Washington, D.C., I had a chance to meet President Bill Clinton. And I wish I could have said, uh, before I met him, that I'd had the thought and the wisdom, as Nehemiah did, to pray before meeting the king, when the king said, what would you like me to do for you? I didn't. I was just happy to have the chance to meet a president, have a few minutes with him and shake his hand. But Nehemiah did. When the king said, what would you like me to do for you? It says in Nehemiah chapter 2, I prayed to the God of heaven. It must have been a short prayer. He was standing before the king that he asked for wisdom. If you remember in James chapter 1, James notes this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him or her ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to you. But let him ask in faith. Let her ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that person expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded, unstable in all his or her ways. Nehemiah asked in faith for the wisdom to, to tell this king what he needed. And he said, King, would you give me permission to go back to Jerusalem? to rebuild the walls around the city, to install the gates. And the king said, not only will I do that, I'm going to send you a small army to go with you, captains to go with you. And here's a letter for, the, for Asaph, who was the keeper of the king's force, to get all the timber you need to build the gates. And here's letters to get through all the provinces, because it wasn't like going from Central City to Grand Island. From Susa to Jerusalem was 800 miles. That's about as far as from Omaha, Nebraska, to Billings, Montana. That's a long way to go back in that day. And that's how far Nehemiah went. All right, so here come his challenges. He finally gets to the city, and not only are the Jews demoralized and discouraged, there's opposition. The leaders of that day were not too keen about the Jews rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem to become a stronger people. There was ridicule, there was opposition, and there were death threats on the life of Nehemiah. So how did they do this? Half of the people put swords on, guarded the workers while they rebuilt the walls, and then they took turns doing the opposite. Then the workers became the guards. Get this, in 52 days, they rebuilt the walls of the city and installed the gates. In 52 days. And nothing had happened from 516 BC to 445 BC. It took Nehemiah to answer the call of God. All of you know well known, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I've wondered sometimes if maybe Nehemiah would have written a psalm along those lines for his own experiences, and maybe he would have said something like this. 
The God of Jerusalem is my life, and all I want is to protect my people. God maketh me stand against tyranny, and he leadeth me to a battlefield far away from my home to the king's palace. God is my strength. He leadeth me to risk my life for my people. Yea, though I walk 800 miles into uncertainty and danger, I will fear no evil. For you, my God, and my sword are with me. My love and devotion to you leads me on. Thou preparest a calling for me to heed in the presence of my enemies. My way of life will be forever changed and made to me. Surely my decision to follow you, O oh my God, is final, and I will keep my eye on the prize of the day that one day I will be with you in heaven. Perhaps so. I don't know what he was thinking, but he had to have gone through some pretty hard times as he faced that opposition and that ridicule. But notice this, too, that not only are there challenges, and he had many, they did get the walls rebuilt in 52 days, there were blessings. If you choose to follow God in your life, there will be blessings. You can be sure of it. There's no wonder here that prayer became part of the key opening the door to blessings in Nehemiah's life, and so too in ours. So one of my real points of my little homily this morning is to ask you, how much do you pray in your lives? And what, what challenges do you face, and how do you approach them? Do you try to figure them out yourselves? Do you go to maybe see a counselor? Not always a bad idea. Do you read books? Do you pray? And how much time do you pray in a given day? Not to say that the more we pray, somehow the more holy we are. But the more you want to get to know God, it seems like the more time you're going to spend with him. At least that's the way I'm, I'm thinking here. In an anthology dedicated to a woman named Phyllis Tickle, interesting name, uh, who happened to be an Episcopalian, there's a woman by the name of Lauren Winter who wrote a chapter called Prayer is a Place. She notes, I lead lots of spiritual retreats, women's retreats, Lenten and quiet days, prayer retreats. There is always a discussion of prayer, how hard it is to squeeze it in, how hard it is among the many demands of children, jobs, the to-do list. All of the advice I dole out at these retreats is useless, illegal or impossible or both in a women's prison or ministry. You cannot light a candle. You cannot go to a quiet room, sit in your favorite chair, close the door. You cannot have a special mug for tea, and know that mug is your prayer mug, when you settle down with red zinger tea, and know you are settling into prayer. Last week, a week ago today, I went to the state penitentiary in Lincoln, and visited actually a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, this particular individual played on the Nebraska football team, on their one of their winning teams in 1994, uh, now finds himself in prison. And when I visited with Eric, uh, he said to me, you know, you're the first visitor I've had in 10 years. In 10 years. And I thought of all the things that we could talk about in those two hours, and they went by really fast. But at the end, I said, would you mind if I prayed with you? So we're in this big room with all the guards and other inmates and other visitors. And he said, I'd love to pray with you. This big man, six foot four, linebacker, tight end, I think he was a tight end, bowed his head with me and we prayed together. And when he went back later, he wrote me a letter this week and he said, everybody in his unit asked what had happened because his face was just beaming, glowing. You see, he found Christ in prison five years ago. And he wasn't ashamed to pray on all the people there in that room. If he can pray where he is, how much more we can pray where we are the lives that we live, the things that we do. And now we come, full circle, to our reading today, Nehemiah. So if you'll pull out your bulletin insert, a couple of things I'll show you. From the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, this is when revival takes place. We've talked about revival probably before at different times, but you see, when, when God really catches you and grabs you, 